when we look at the medium of exchange, the money, you know, we went from shells to gold to paper money representing gold to paper money kind of representing gold to paper money that's now tied to oil. Uh, ever since the U.S. brokered a deal with Saudi Arabia to only sell its oil for U.S. dollars. And since everyone needs oil, that maintained the U.S. dollar as the reserve currency, and we call this the petrodollar. I wanted to play a clip from a 2006 Ron Paul speech on the House floor called The End of the Dollar Hegemony, which you reference in the book. Let's roll that clip, and I have a question about it for you. After all these many years of great success, our dollar dominance is coming to an end. It has been said, rightly, that he who holds the gold makes the rules. That general rule has held fast throughout the ages. When gold was used and the rules protected honest commerce, productive nations thrive. Today, the principles are the same, but the process is quite different. Gold is no longer a currency of the realm. Paper is. The truth now is... He who prints the money makes the rules, at least for the time being. Although gold is not used, the goals are the same. Compel foreign countries to produce and subsidize the country with military superiority and control over the monetary printing presses. Since printing paper money is nothing short of counterfeiting, the issuer of an international currency must always be the country with the military might to guarantee control over the system. It is now common knowledge that the immediate reaction of the administration after 9-11 revolved around how they could con uh, connect Saddam Hussein to the attack to justify an invasion and overthrow of his government. It's not likely that maintaining dollar supremacy was the only motivating factor for the war against Iraq, nor for agitating against Iran. Though the real reasons for going to war are complex, we now know the reasons given before the war started, like the presence of weapons of mass destruction and Saddam Hussein's connection to 9-11 were false. What did you find compelling or illuminating about this speech? So what I found interesting is that the U.S. has a pretty aggressive history of going after countries that um, sell oil uh, in non-dollar currencies. Um, you know, there's a lot of dictators in the world, and we don't really uh, go after them. Uh, some of them even actually do have weapons of mass destruction to, to some some degree, at least. And we just don't really do much other than sanction them and stuff. Uh, but the ones where we tend to have a more aggressive role are ones that try to sell outside of the dollar-based system. And so, you know, on some sense, the dollar network effect is self-sustaining. I mean, when it's tied when it's tied to the largest economy that has an open capital market. Um, uh, it's got a very large existing debt base around the world, and debt represents demand for currency. It's contractual demand for currency, so you have a built-in inflexible demand source. Um, these are all kind of existing network effects, supports of the dollar, but it's th they still feed the network effect from time to time, especially in the 70s is when they kind of uh, kind of resurrected it from having broken the Bretton Woods system. And some of these more recent ones, the reason I find this clip interesting is that it, it basically shows that the list of reasons that were given uh, to invade Iraq uh, and take some of these other actions were unjustified. And therefore, it basically argues that it had something to do with trying to maintain the, the existing money system. Something that you, you hear from many libertarians, especially fans of Ron Paul and ending the Fed, is that once it's all about the money printer and it, it, the creation of money gets so centralized, that that fuels war. Uh, you lay that out in detail using World War I and Britain as an example. How many things have gone differently? I know counterfactuals are hard, but can you imagine what a different situation it might have been if fiat money had not come into existence around World War I? So I think that it's not that fiat currency came in existing around World War One. I. I think it's actually kind of the opposite. World War One, it part was a world war because that was kind of the first major war where it, it this this world now existed. This telecommunication enhanced gold standard system could be readily rug pulled. So prior prior mm -hmm. to that point, whenever a country wanted to debase its currency, so it wants to go to war, taxes aren't popular, 
it's hard to tell someone we have to raise your taxes to go kill these people on this other continent. You know, it, it's 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 if you're being invaded, it's one thing. But if you're going to go invade others or do things like that, it, it's hard to sell that. Uh, and so rulers have historically turned to debasement. Uh, but debasement is actually a pretty slow process with coinage. Um, <clears throat> you have to physically pull the money in with taxes or other methods, remelt it into these, you know, debased forms, making use of the fact that you can get more coins with that. Uh, and so it takes time to to pull that in, remelt it, and then uh, try to do it in such a way that's not super obvious, and and it just kind of you, you just kind of boil the frog slowly, uh, so to speak. Um, what made this world different is that with everybody putting their money in banks. Um, and banks then became big honeypots, right? So instead of going to get everyone's gold, a, a country could be like, well, there's like, you know, kind of 10 banks in the country and we can just, we can just, with a stroke of a pen, we can be like, okay, so all of that has to be deposited at the central bank and you're all going to use the same ledger now. It's just very easy to central, once something becomes centralized, it's easy for it to be centrally controlled as well. Um, and so in that era, where everybody's gold's in the banking system, the banking system is centralized, and basically the government, the central bank, have most of the gold in their control, um, or even just on member banks, but they know where it is, and they can easily just re uh, create rules about who can you know, redeem it, or if they have to turn it over physically, things like that. Once that's all in place, literally a stroke of a pen can just say, well, all those bank claims you have are now cut in half relative to gold overnight, uh, it's a much faster debasement process. Uh, you can even debase foreign holders of your currency and bonds very easily. Um, so basically, it's the, the 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 speed and the power with which you can rug pull people uh, to allocate that value towards war is significantly enhanced. And so, I think if you were to rerun the opening of World War One before this, and this technology just wasn't around yet, it's unclear that it would have spread nearly as wide as it did because. You know the 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 number of entities that got in at the size they did was in large part due to that printing printing press, um, and that's something that it's you know it's hard to say what the world would have looked like uh, yeah. had that not happened. But I do think that it's not a coincidence that they were that they were somewhat conjoined in that way. Hey, thanks for watching that clip from my conversation with Lynn Alden about her new book, Broken Money. You can watch another clip right here or the full conversation over here.